Um, yeah, Frank, were you getting any kind of echo from my microphone? Are we okay here? No, it was Steve Farrell was the echo, so I had to mute it. Okay. Lots of us Steves tend to be problems. So there you go. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, okay. Well, let's see. Uh, Frank, if uh, I, I can uh, share a screen, is that okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah you okay. Have, you have complete control. Look at that. Complete control. Just imagine that. That's a little bit on the scary side. Um, all right, let's see what I can give to you here. Um, I don't have an awful lot to share. Uh, that is uh, an awful lot of screen sharing that we need to do. Um, but it will be, I think, a little bit helpful for for maybe everybody that's for looking on. Uh, if you've got a Bible, you can look at. Uh, there'll be a couple of texts that we'll be looking at kind of closely. And maybe one thing that it will be helpful for us to see more about, you know, as we as we go a little bit further. So we'll kind of see what that uh, is like. Um, but wait a minute, I, I'm not being able to pull up what I need to pull up. Let me see. Here we go. All right there. You're looking at Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right, that might be helpful for us uh, just as a as a starting place. Let me tell you kind of what I've got in mind <clears throat> for these several weeks that we have together in February. Um, this is a little bit less a uh, scholarly project that I'm thinking about, which sometimes is what uh, I come and talk to you folks about, and a little bit more a, um, I don't know what to call it, you know, a kind of a pet peeve, but that's not exactly right. It was something that came up uh, just a month or so ago, maybe maybe two months, um, in some interaction in my church, and it has mostly to do with my own, some questions that I found myself raising in some interaction in a, a Sunday school class kind of context, you know, um, that, that just raised some interesting questions for me and have sent me back to some books that I haven't looked at in a while and and that sort of thing. And so I'd like, because I'd like to know more about this, I thought, well, why not Why not talk with you folks about it? Um, so here's sort of the story that lies behind it. Um, uh, during the Christmas season or the Advent season, you know, approaching Christmas, I found myself reading the book of Isaiah, uh, reading the whole book of Isaiah, sort of an ordinary, you know, making my way through the book of Isaiah. It just happened to be during the season of Advent. And I found myself very aware of how commonly texts from Isaiah reappear in the New Testament, uh, in, in things that are related, of course, to, uh, to Christmas uh, and to the promise of uh, one on whose shoulders the government will rest and that kind of thing. But also, uh, in particular, uh, you know, texts that are related to uh, the, the larger scheme of Christ's work. And I'm thinking especially then of Isaiah 53 and the, and the, the immense uh, truths that we find here about Christ, who will be at that point, who was from our vantage point, wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities and uh, the punishment that made us whole is upon him by his by his stripes or by his bruises we are healed. Okay, uh, everybody knows this kind of talk, um, but I found myself reading this and I was remembering some conversations that we had in, uh, in another Sunday school class related to this uh, suffering servant kind of passage in, uh, in Isaiah 53. And I found myself especially exploring some of the other servant passages in Isaiah. Some of you know, most folks that look at uh, the book of Isaiah uh, from a scholarly vantage point say that there are at least four servant songs that especially highlight the importance of the servant of the Lord. The interesting thing for me was, and this is not actually what we're going to talk very much about today, but I found myself not just looking here at Isaiah 53, but looking back at some of the earlier servant songs, in uh, Isaiah 41 and 42, where, here's the key, we don't have to worry too much about the details, where uh, 
in great detail and very explicitly, God says who his servant is. And his servant in Isaiah 41, I'm just looking at verse, uh, at verse 8, uh, his servant is Israel. Here is what Isaiah, what the Lord says through Isaiah, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. This kind of language gets picked up explicitly in the servant of the Lord song that's in Isaiah 42. Uh, it reappears later in Isaiah 49, a little bit in Isaiah 50. You know, I found myself saying, it's a typical thing. I wasn't paying attention to the class, you might say. I was off in my own little world. Um, and I found myself saying, what are we saying? Why are we saying that what we find in Isaiah 53 is the servant of the Lord and that points so explicitly to Jesus? When, in fact, at many points in, in Isaiah's prophecies, the servant of the Lord, the one who will do this marvelous work through the Lord's hand that will change the world, is Israel. This, of course, is the way that the Jewish people tend to read that text, uh, all of those texts today, including uh, Isaiah 53. And so, so this is the question that was in my mind, right? How do we, how is it that we find Jesus in these texts that say very explicitly that the servant of the Lord is Israel? That's the question. In one way, it's got a very simple answer. Um, that's what Jesus taught us, right? We didn't just steal these texts uh, from, from our Jewish friends and brothers and sisters. Um, but instead, it seems as though Jesus himself indicated that Isaiah 53, at least, is a reference to him. You get a reference to this uh, most explicitly down here toward the end, where in Luke's gospel, just think about this as we're looking at, uh, buh, 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 uh, at uh, verse 12 here, right? Jesus in Luke's gospel says to the disciples, as things are getting pretty intense, it's Luke chapter 22. Now he says, the one, uh, the one among you who has a purse must take it and likewise a bag. And the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one, right? Things are getting intense. For I tell you, says Jesus, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless. Some translations, he was numbered among the transgressors. You see that here in uh, verse 12 of Isaiah 53. Uh, Jesus says, he was counted among the lawless, numbered among the transgressors, and indeed what is written about me is being fulfilled. All right, this is written about Jesus. But of course, it seems as though it's also written about Israel. And so this was the question that was in my mind. The whole question got raised, and I found myself asking, how do we go about seeing Jesus in Isaiah 53? Or how did Jesus go about seeing that? You might say, if Jesus saw himself in this text, then what else did Jesus see? How did Jesus read the Old Testament in the way that got the results that it got? You know, in a certain sense, uh, there's clearly there's an awful lot there, right? Jesus says at some points, like in John 5, just a single verse or two, you'll remember this. Jesus says to those he's debating with, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is they that testify of me, right? A few verses later on, uh, don't think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. All right. Um, pretty clearly, Jesus reads Moses, and he hears things that others there weren't hearing, 
And can I say this? When I tend to be reading Moses, I think I usually am hearing the same things that the Jews heard. I'm not always hearing Jesus there quite so much. But it's very clear that Jesus sees a lot there. So let's look at one more text here on the screen, or it's Luke 24, if you want to take a look at it, right? I am interested here, right? This is a story about uh, after Jesus has raised from the dead, we've got at the beginning of, of chapter 24. It's in that famous story about uh, him walking, taking a stroll with some folks that didn't know him uh, on the way to Emmaus that I'm especially interested in. And you'll remember the way this goes, right? I'm not going to read through the whole story. Jesus falls into step with uh, Cleopas and uh, someone else, an unnamed you know, person with him. Uh, and they start to talk about the weird things that are going on. And Jesus, of course, he's been raised from the dead. He knows what's been going on, but he says what things. And so they sort of summarize the ministry and the hopes that were in that. They note that there have been some odd stories about Jesus having been, after being crucified, coming back to life. Um, and Jesus ends up rebuking them because they weren't seeing what was really going on in all of the texts that are behind us, right? So you remember this. Um, I'm looking here at verse uh, 25. Um, then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. A lot of people point out in this text, you know, that Jesus, maybe surprisingly, does not rebuke the disciples for failing to heed his own predictions of his death. You notice that? Jesus did very clearly tell the disciples, here's what's coming. He doesn't rebuke them for not believing that. Instead, he kind of scolds them because you haven't believed what the prophets said. And then, of course, he opens their minds in some way, or he, he talks to them about Scripture. A little bit later on, he opens their minds uh, to understand the Scriptures, and he opens their eyes so that they can see that he himself is the raised Christ. You remember how all this goes. But the interesting thing is that Jesus very clearly here seems to think that what the Old Testament teaches you might say, is not just a couple of interesting predictions about the future. It's like everything in the Old Testament, Jesus saw pointing to a fulfillment that is himself. In fact, isn't it interesting that, uh, you know, here, if we go a little higher up, right, up here in verses uh, 21, 22, 23, Cleopas and his traveling companion there, they had all of the data about what had taken place, right? They knew Jesus had been crucified. They believed he was the Messiah. They saw him crucified. Now they've heard rumors about him being raised from the dead. And yet with all of that in place, they still did not connect this to things from the Old Testament. And Jesus says that they should have. The Old Testament teaching was, you know, an open book for Jesus. But it wasn't, of course, for those who heard him teach and saw him crucified and then heard that he had been raised. They didn't say, see, I knew that was there because we'd seen that in, in our Bible. They didn't say that. Instead, there was something that was missing. All right, so what was missing? That's sort of the question that I would invite us to pursue. And this is why I'd said, you know, when I was looking for a title for our, our time together, you know, these next several weeks, uh, I think we will talk about Jesus's reading of the Old Testament. Um, and I kind of toyed with snarkier titles. Should we talk about the highlighter with which Jesus highlighted his Bible? Uh, I doubt that Jesus had a highlighter and that they didn't work too good on papyrus scrolls, I suspect, anyhow. Um, but it does seem that there's indication 
that when Jesus read his text, he saw things there constantly that if I were seeing this in my Bible, I would be underlining. I would be making connections between things. Jesus saw that everywhere. And of course, on the road to Emmaus, the disciples end up saying, remember how our hearts burned when Jesus was opening scripture to us. You remember that? That's what I'd like to pursue. That's what I find myself kind of kind of interested in um, these days, you might say. So let me tell you what I'd like to do. Uh, I am pursuing um, this some of this material largely under the tutelage of a scholar that some of you may know. Uh, I'm thinking of Richard Hayes, who is um, Professor Emeritus, I think now at Duke Divinity School. Um, I've got in mind especially a series of lectures he did uh, 10 years ago or so called that's been published under the title of Reading Backwards, where he's talking about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and so I'm going to use some of his language. I'm not sure that everything that he does is exactly right, but he helps, I think, to open up some of the ways that we can see Jesus's reading of texts in very, very intriguing ways. And the language that he uses when he describes this, let me give you one other screen to look at here. The language that he uses is speaking of uh, what he calls figural interpretation or figural reading of scripture. He himself says that he gets this term from a famous passage in this, a book by Eric Auerbach, another scholar, some of you may know from the kind of mid to late 20th century. Um, so uh, a text that talks about what exactly we're looking for when we go into a biblical text with Jesus in mind. I want to get us to text pretty quickly, but this helps to set the stage for it, I think, right? So here's what Auerbach says in one of his books, right? Uh, figural interpretation or figural reading establishes a connection between two events or persons in such a way that the first signifies not only itself, but also the second, while the second involves or fulfills the first. The two poles of a figure are separated in time, but both being real events or persons are within temporality. They are both contained in the flowing stream, which is historical life. And only the comprehension of their interdependence is a spiritual act. All right. Hayes points to this, and then he invites us to see several kind of interesting things going on in this, in this idea of figural interpretation. He says, the really interesting thing is, this doesn't involve so much going back to the Old Testament and finding predictions about Jesus. There are predictions about Jesus. Uh, I, I don't think it's hard to say that. Certainly the New Testament looks and sees certain kinds of things as straightforward predictions. But in lots and lots of cases, like, for example, Isaiah 53, what looks to us pretty clearly like a, like a, a prediction, indeed, I know many Jewish people who describe reading Isaiah 53, and it's hard not to see the story of Jesus in Isaiah 53, right? Um, but of course, it took 700 years for folks to see that, and those texts were meaningful apart from that. So in a way, Lots of the material that we find in the Old Testament that we associate with Christ had its own, you might say, its own local meaning, though it also turned out to be doing larger things than merely what was local. Now, once we see the full story, Jesus crucified and raised, then maybe it's natural for us to go back and to look at the text and say, oh, look, here's something that seems as though it was talking about this. See, the interesting thing to me is Jesus read those texts and he saw what was going on there before it actually happened. It's not as though Jesus merely 
you know, saw a, one event and was reminded of something in the scriptures, as you and I might be. Instead, Jesus saw the scriptures and ended up reading his life in terms of them. They fit together. Now, in one sense, you can say, well, of course he did, right? He's God. He knew exactly what was there. He didn't have to wait for things to happen to know what was going to happen. And no doubt there's there's truth in that. I, I don't, of course, dispute that at all. I am interested, though, in the way in which Jesus, you remember, the man Jesus, the boy Jesus even, who grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, there's something about Jesus growing up and growing into this understanding of Scripture that really intrigues me. Can you imagine the boy Jesus at the age of 12 going into the temple? Maybe already he's heard stories from his mother about his own birth, about the significance that's associated with him. Mary doesn't understand it all, but she passes along some of what happened. Jesus knows big things have going on. God is his father in some distinctive way. I have no doubt that's true. But, you know, I've got a 13-year-old. It's astonishing to me that 12-year-old Jesus is cluing into this. <laughs> right? He's, But he's seeing things then in his text that mean more than what you might have expected them to see. He's not just seeing predictions of what would happen. Instead, there are patterns that Jesus sees everywhere that increasingly fit together. It is like, here's an image that is really helpful to me. Can I tell you, I don't remember whether I got it from Hayes or from some other source, but this is interesting. I think it's like somebody said, and so I'm just copying this unknown person, maybe it's Hayes. It's like when you see um, one of those things, people call them different things, uh, a magic picture or something, you know, yeah. a, a strange sort of um, uh, configuration of colors and, and patterns and things like that, that looks just like a chaotic, uh, maybe artistic something put together. And it turns out that if you look at it in a certain way, there's a 3D image inside of it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right? You recognize that. Mm -hmm. You can have all of the details of a picture like that in place. You can see every single pixel, if you're looking at it online, every color, every swerve, and never see the 3D image. But of course, there's a way of seeing the 3D image. Somehow you have to adjust your eyes or focus in a different way. And then suddenly the 3D image is fully there. It's not like, it's not as though it's only something that you kind of interpret this way or something like that. It's not a subjective reading. It's there, right there in the picture. But of course, you've got to, be able to look at it in the right way in order to see it. So I, I am very interested then in how it is that Jesus looks everywhere in the Old Testament and sees every curve, every color, every pixel in the Old Testament and finds it all coming together in a way that shows the Messiah going to the cross dying for the sins of the world, being raised from the dead, and drawing all things together then in him. You get the idea? Yeah. See what I've got in mind? So here is kind of what I would like to do. Um, and we'll, well, I'll show you one quick text about this now, just to give you a hint of more of what we'll be doing in the future. In one way, I'm just interested in looking at the particular text that Jesus especially quotes or explicitly refers to in the Gospels. It seems to me that will give us a fair amount, fair number of clues, right? Where is it that we find Jesus quoting his Bible? Uh, and of course, there's an awful lot of interesting stuff there. Interestingly enough, and I'm following Hayes again now, you also find all sorts of things, all sorts of what Richard Hayes calls echoes of the Old Testament in the Gospels, places where Jesus seems to have had particular texts in mind even when he's not quoting them. And can I show you one instance of this? Because I think this is the kind of thing that's especially um, interesting to us. I'm, uh, I've got in mind here Mark chapter 12. This comes directly from Hayes' book, uh, Reading Backwards. 
And Hayes set side by side Jesus telling the what we usually call the parable of the tenants in Mark chapter 12. He sets it alongside a version of that parable that comes from the non-canonical gospel of Thomas, right? Uh, what the gospel of Thomas does is to tell that story with no significant references to the Old Testament. It's just a story. If we were to read through that, if we had a few more minutes, maybe we would do that. It's a coherent story about um, a man having a vineyard and letting it out to some people and then trying to collect his, uh, you know, his fees and the servants get beat, uh, get, get kind of beat up. Uh, the tenants uh, are not wanting to pay. And so the owner sends his son and they seize and kill him. And so Jesus says, show me the stone which the builders rejected. It's the cornerstone. Doesn't that sound a lot like the parable of the tenants that you know? This is the gospel of Thomas. I read that and it sounds very familiar to me. It's Hayes that points out when we actually go to Mark's gospel, we find that Jesus tells that, gives that parable and fills it with images that any good Jew would have recognized as being virtual quotations from the Old Testament. But what Jesus puts in all points to things that the Pharisees that he was arguing with did not see. So can you see the bold face type here that I put a whoops, uh, wrong one uh, that I've put in the right hand margin? Um, when Jesus says a man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. It is very clear when you go back and look at Isaiah chapter five, yeah. that Jesus has in mind the song of the vineyard that is repeated many places in the book of Isaiah, but especially there in chapter five. It's a parable about judgment, about God's judgment that are, that's that's coming. And when Jesus's interlocutors heard Jesus telling a story that began this way, they inevitably would have had Isaiah chapter five in place. I wouldn't have that in place, but they would. So Jesus begins, you might say, with an Old Testament quotation. Jesus would have had this text in Isaiah 5 highlighted. He goes and tells the story then, the story that we're familiar with, but there's, again, some interesting texts that get added in. Jesus does not merely say, so the owner sent his son. Jesus says he had still one other, a beloved son. Some of you may recognize this phrase, the beloved son, is language that is used again very explicitly in the Old Testament in a variety of places where we find in Genesis 22, it's it's uh, Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Your son, your beloved son is the one you are to offer in sacrifice. Remember that language? Or again, the stuff in Psalm 2 is all about the son of David, who becomes the one who will reign as king forever. Um, Isaiah 42, another text that has that same sort of uh, echo that's involved. In other words, it looks as though Jesus had particular texts from the Old Testament in mind. He had seen patterns related to what happens to the beloved son in Old Testament texts and he reads those or includes those into his own parable because he said that seen there's meaning there. Next line, right down here in, in verse, verse seven, when Jesus says, not merely the tenants seized and killed this neck, this the heir, but instead they use the words in their own reflections, come, let us kill him which it, it turns out is an exact quotation of uh, in, in the Greek from the, the, the Greek, the Septuagint language that you find in Genesis 37 about the, from the story of Joseph. Do you remember that? When Joseph's brothers set out and intend, they plot to take Joseph and kill him. Of course, they end up not doing that. They sell him into slavery instead. But the point is this language comes explicitly from that story. 
Jesus read the story of Joseph, and it seems as though he saw there a kind of act of betrayal that in the end would lead to a sacrifice that would have some sort of salvific activity going on. You see how there's not exactly, you know, there's not a footnote in my New Testament that says, here's Jesus quoting this text. But Jesus read that text and presumably the whole story of Joseph. And he said, there are patterns here about what is to come. And then finally, of course, the one place where Jesus does quote this text uh, down at the end here of, uh, of the parable, Jesus explicitly refers to Psalm 18, where the stone that the builders rejected is the cornerstone. And this is an amazing thing. And notice then the closing line here in this, in this pericope from, from Mark 12, when they realized they, that is the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, when they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him. So they they got this, not just as a story saying, you guys are problems. They got it as saying, the whole Old Testament is against you. The whole Bible, Moses, the prophets, all the Old Testament, you have overlooked the inner meaning of. Jesus saw the inner meaning. So you see what's going on there? I hope in the next several weeks to be looking at some texts like this so that we can try to get at some of the crucial points at which Jesus highlighted his biblical text, his Hebrew Bible. And following that highlighting, I would love to see then how it is that the patterns jump out all over the place. I think they do. The Pharisees got that impression and didn't believe it. I hope that we can see it and believe it and read the text a little bit more as Jesus read it. That's where we're headed. Uh, let me stop there and just ask questions, comments uh, about this text, about others, other things that I've said. What are you thinking? Um, I have a, <clears throat> Joe Modica gave us years ago a, a, a uh, an excerpt from an appendix of a book by Stephen Moise, Moise called Jesus and Scripture Studying the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. Right, right. Um, academic in 2010. Um, and what it, the appendix was an index of Jesus' quotations from the gospel. Yeah. And, uh, um, and I, I sort of just did a, a quick calculation and, and there are, in Matthew, there are 44 quotations um, and in Mark 21 and Luke 22 and in John 8, total of 95 altogether, at least in his list. And uh, as you were speaking, I was looking to see uh, for Mark 12 uh, citations, and there are six. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, they go back to um, Leviticus, a couple from Deuteronomy, uh, from Psalm 118. You said Psalm 18. I didn't know if you meant 118, but a couple from that. Um it's just, it's interesting to see how thoroughly direct quotations, you know, of the Old Testament uh, turn up, you know, uh, not to mention the, the implied quotations that you refer to, which I think right. adds a whole other dimension to it. Right. right. Yeah, you know, some yeah. people say, I haven't done the math, some people say that uh, of the, uh, of the, um, you know, I can't remember now exactly what the 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 <laughs> what the numbers refer to, but it's something like ten percent of the actual words that come to us from Jesus. You know, the stuff in red. If you've got a red letter Bible, roughly ten percent is quotation of Old Testament, right? That strikes me as astonishingly high. You know, if you had a preacher that was merely quoting the Old Testament with 10% of what he does, you might say, all right, come on, we can read the Old Testament for ourselves, you know, tell us more about it, you know. Jesus seemed to think that there's something about these texts that are important enough that you just get them out there and you start to see larger things. I think we well, don't always see those larger things. The other things. thing is that these were written after Jesus' life, and so 
these uh, references are coming coming down through you know through the the means by which they were able to sit down and write these gospels. I mean, right, right, right. There's there's a, a, a definite um, absorption of of those you know indications in the writing of these. <clears throat> right. Yeah. You know, I, I I'm I'm a little. Um, I, I'm, of, I'm of two minds about, about this. In a certain sense, I am not just interested in what the disciples saw after Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, and where they went back and said, ah, look, here's a text that seems like it's connected there, right? Uh, of course, I respect the disciples an awful lot, and the inspired text before us really matters. But in a way, I'm thinking more explicitly, not just about what the disciples saw after the fact, Clearly that happened, but Jesus saw it all before the fact. And presumably that's part of the reason that the disciples were able to see afterwards, right? It's because Jesus was saying all along, this is what the scripture requires. This is the 3D image that all of that two-dimensional stuff that you're reading about in your Bibles really has as its center. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll pay attention to, to the apostolic uh account of what Jesus says and of course the apostles themselves also add in some of of uh, what they see in the Old Testament so Steve, I, Steve I, I thought I thought you were going to go even more uh get even more explicit and and tie us back to Jesus instructing um uh, the folks on the road to Emmaus if he was being that explicit in pulling this all together for those two nice fellas what do you think he might have done with his the, the inner circle with the disciples and and perhaps being as explicit as at least as explicit as he was with the folks on the road to Emmaus yeah yeah well interestingly you know one of the places right after that in Luke 24 right after that story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus Jesus appears to the 12 or, you know, appears to the larger band of disciples. And it's there that Luke tells us Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And, you know, the, the summary that's there is very interesting. I had my Bible open to that just a second ago. Um, here's the language that you get in Luke 24, um, verse 45 and following. Um, this is Jesus. Or, or this is Luke. Uh, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. It doesn't say so they could see the 3D image, but that's kind of what I have in mind. Um, he told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Your witnesses of these things. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus would say there, this is what is written, and then not quote the text, right? Instead, he thinks once you've seen it, you don't have to quote the text. Instead, you see that the meaning of the text all through is the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached, right? And so Jesus passed that along then. You know, he opens the mind of the disciples to understand that, presumably there job is to open our minds as well so that's what i hope we'll be and doing that here. was and that was referenced luke um what was that last reference 24 45 up to about uh, 48 24 okay thank you yeah i i have i've been long convinced that the the, our understanding of passion week and 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 much of jesus's um uh, activities and and uh, preaching was planned by him in advance hmm. and I, I i particularly kept captured my mind as in mark 11 11 which is uh really easy to understand easy to remember that after this momentous day where he goes into the uh the city in triumph and he clears the uh uh, he creates an act that's going to call attention to him and what he's saying. Jesus goes into the temple grounds at the end of the day and looks around. Yeah, that's right. I can quote it that's exactly right. here. 
he yeah. says, uh, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple courts and he looked around at everything. Right. And then since it was late, he went back to Bethany. Right. Now, he, right. he has his marketing plan and he's fulfilled that part of his marketing plan that he devised in the de in the wilderness. But now is the crucial week. So he goes into the temple and he sees the events that he must fulfill, mm. that he must fulfill, mm. according to the suffering servant passages. And he, he arranges things mm. so that they happen in the, in the order that brings him to the cross. Mm. That's my, that's my life. That's my life belief in, in, in what Jesus is doing here. Right. It certainly is true. I think I think all the scholars say that uh, that yeah. Jesus's clearing of the temple was a kind of um, street theater, you might say, where very intentionally he was enacting something that he wanted the public to see. Um, so clearly that's going on. I wouldn't want to take that idea in too much a way as though Jesus sort of is manipulating what's going on there in order to get the Pharisees to crucify him or something. You know, it well, seems pretty clear that that the fulfillment is taking place, not just that Jesus is kind of doing it in the obvious sense, I would say. But, well, there, there's an inertia in the in the society. Yeah. That's yeah. going to, to but he has to to fit himself it's like a picture puzzle and he's got to fit himself into those those places where the picture the 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 pieces have not yet been put in place uh-huh yeah yeah steve just a um, a thought if if um when you get to that fourth week of february and you run out of things to say ha 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 um <laughs> i i i find myself listening to you and thinking about other people who have read Old and New Testament, sure. Sure. especially prophecies, and have claimed that that's pointing to them. You know, some false teachers, false leaders, some misuse uh, of scripture. And, and I don't know if that would be helpful to have that as a comparison or if that's a rabbit hole you don't want to go down, but I'll just yeah. throw it out there and... Uh, <clears throat> Let's yeah, do with yeah. whatever you want. No, I think that sounds very interesting. It may be something very much worth pursuing when we run out of things to say. Ha, ha, ha. Yes, I'm with you. <laughs> there are five Thursdays in February. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, and the Steve won't be here for the last one. So we talked about maybe having Montre come back or something, but maybe we should talk about Steve behind his back while he's uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> on spring break somewhere sunny and warm man. hey i might be talking about you too you never know <laughs> yeah. 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 we can take Steve, it would you close us in prayer please yeah yeah i'd be glad to do that let's pray together guys holy father in jesus's name i feel very much the the weight of talking about things too large for me i'm afraid that I am an awful lot like Cleopas and his comrade on the road to Emmaus. I need my eyes opened. Don't all of us. It seems clear that there is so much more going on than we have uh, the, the, the wherewithal to unpack or to perceive. So, Lord our God, uh, as always, we put ourselves in your hands. We pray that your truth and power will sustain us when we are weak. We ask that you'll go ahead of us in this kind of study and let us see better than we can see so that your fullness will shine for us and we can honor you well. Uh, I do pray just for us as we go into the day now too, whatever that looks like for different ones among us, uh, will you sustain us there also? Grant that we can see your work, see your truth, live in the glory of God in a way that the world will see and uh, and appreciate. Grant us eyes ourselves. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Steve.